So this morning we're meant to be back in the Ask Us Anything series and the question was what happens when we die? But I feel God's asked me to read another passage and I don't know whether we'll get into the question or not. Let's just see where the Holy Spirit takes us this morning. But on the back of that song I felt God tell me to read the passage where Peter walks on water. And for those of us that maybe have been Christians for some time, followers of Jesus for some time, it's probably quite a familiar passage. And I don't know where God necessarily wants to go with this. But I trust the Holy Spirit wants me to read it to us this morning and we'll see what happens. So it's found in the book of Matthew, chapter 14. So if you've got a Bible, open it up please. Matthew 14, verse 22. Matthew 14, 22. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. This is Jesus who's just been hanging out with some people and he's now asked the disciples to move aside and go out onto the water while he says goodbye to the people he's been speaking to. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. We read that this passage has got something to do with faith. And this is something that God has been stirring in us as a people for a long time. He's been saying to us, what does it look like to be a people who walk by faith and not by sight? And maybe that's why he's asked me to speak on this passage this morning. Although I've prepared something completely different, maybe he's saying to me, this is what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. For us to not be so set on the path that we think he's known we know is best and right but be willing to be changed and inconvenienced by the Holy Spirit I don't know about you but I'm quite a determined person I, I, you know I have a set way of doing things and a goal and when I've got my mind fixed on something I kind of go at it hammer and tongs You know, like this week I've been trying to get my bus engine working, so any minute I get, even if I'm back late at night, there I am with my torch in the the bonnet of the car, trying to work out, spending hours just to get one little 10 mil nut on a thread. And, And I'm really fixed and focused and determined. But the problem with that is, is that we can easily miss the voice of God. When we've got our kind of way mapped out, when we think, you know, this is the way I'm supposed to go, sometimes it's really hard to hear God's voice in the midst of that. And I believe God is calling us to be a people that are literally willing to move, change direction the moment he speaks. But as we walk by faith, not by sight, we are not bound, we are not determined that the external circumstances and people and situations that we face are not meant to be the things that determine the actions that we take. You know, it's so easy to, to kind of, you know, we, uh, you've probably heard this phrase if you're a Christian, I'll, I'll, I'll push a door and see if it opens. You know, we're led by circumstances. I'll push a door and see if it opens. Or the classic one from the Gideon whole idea is I'll lay down a fleece and see whether God answers it. I'm not saying these things are wrong. But what happens if God wants us to act completely differently than the circumstance around us? What if God wants to deepen a relationship with us, have a faith in him that is not based upon the circumstance that we're facing? He's calling us to be a people that are mature, people that know him. Jesus is in the business of relationship. 
And, and the problem with these other ways of doing it, it's circumstantial living does not deepen a relationship with Jesus. It doesn't. You know, it, it basically we don't need Jesus. We'll just say, you know, orchestrate life around me and I'll let you move me like the wind. I'll put up some sails and I'll just see where it goes. I'm not a sailor, but I hear that you can tack against the wind if you know how to sail. You know, sometimes we have to tack against the wind. Sometimes we have to kick a door open. Sometimes we have to pull an open door wide shut because we were never meant to work, walk through it, even though it looked brilliant and promising and open, and that's the way we should go. And yet there are times when we should walk away from that door. And if we haven't got a close relationship with Jesus, if we're not spending time in his presence and getting to know his voice, we will walk through doors we were never meant to. We will stay behind doors that we were never meant to. We will allow circumstances to dictate to us our life rather than the living God. Here's a question. Do you believe God is good? Do you believe he loves you? Do you believe he actually loves you? You know, sometimes I find this overwhelming that, you know, there's me, this individual with my faults and failings, with my hang-ups and my insecurities, with my gifts and my non-gifts. I'm just an insignificant person. And yet in the eyes of God, I am significant. That is phenomenal. If you think of all the billions of people in this world, God knows you intimately. The Bible tells us that he knows every hair upon our heads. Man, I don't even know how many hairs I've got on my head. I don't even know how many hat. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't even know how many fingers I've got on my hands. <laughs> and yet God knows that intimate details. He loves us. And there is not, I want to say this, there's not a person in this room that God has overlooked. Maybe you think, oh, yeah, no, but I, I am one of those. There is not a person in this room that God has not overlooked. He does not overlook people. You're not overlooked. God is intent on you. He has a plan and a purpose for you. He wants to do something, a, a radical shift in us that causes us to actually believe the truth about who he is. Our God is healer, Yahweh Raphael, the God who heals. It's not just what he does, it's who he is. Yahweh Shalom. It's not what he gives, just what he gives peace. He is peace. God is these things. He is love. He is peace. He is joy. You know, Scotty gave that word and Lucy backed it out that God wants to be our joy. This is the joy of the Lord is our strength. And that doesn't mean we're all kind of bouncing around as if, as if we're like high on caffeine. He's not talking about like a pseudo happiness, but a deep inner joy. Something that is not beaten by the winds of this world. A steadfastness. The Bible says that the psalmist sings out, he says, I, I want to worship the rock, the foundation that is greater than I am. He tells us about a sure foundation on which we're to place our feet, to take deep roots into God so that nothing can move us. So that I'm now no longer just determined by the things that Dave's got on his brain, you know, this kind of single-sided go-get-it kind of thing. But I am now fully focused on Jesus, that he is my, he's my delight, my goal, my, all my, my passion. He is the one that I strive after and run after. He's the one that gives me the vision to believe that I can step out on the water. That I can step out against the tide, the wind, the waves. He's the one that enables me to, to not by dis be disappointed by what life has thrown at me, but believe that I have a God that loves me. And no matter what comes against me, he is for me. And that he will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He will never run up or out on me. He doesn't fail us. He never lets us down. I don't know about you, but my life, I've had 
knockbacks. I've, I've been let down at times. And sometimes we can place that on God and say, you know, God must be like this. I, I want us to know he's not like that. An altogether totally different being. God is beyond our imagination. The incomprehensible God. You cannot put words around who he is. We try to. We, we sing songs and we paint pictures more glorious than the sun. You know, think about John in his amazing revelation of Jesus in the book of Revelation. And he says that he sees Jesus and his face is shining like the intensity of the sun. You know, he can't find any greater words than to use. And yet God's radiance, his glory is far more intense than the sun. And we pick out these little things and we try and place it upon God and yet he's so far beyond us and yet he loves us intimately. And he's passionate for us individually. This is the God that we were singing about. Our God is greater. Our God is higher. Is he? Yes, he is. But is he in my life? Is God on the throne in my life? Is God in that place? When nothing else could ever compare to him or ever take his place. You know, that's where I think God's getting us as a church. This this walking by faith thing, it's not kind of there's no kind of like magic word for it. There's no kind of special thing that is attributed to it. It's not like we're super spiritual individuals. It, it, it's purely us saying to God, I will pursue you first. And I'll be willing to hear your voice over every other voice in this world, even my own. To worship God is to give him all that we are. And I see this this story, this amazing encounter that Peter has with Jesus. You know, and some people have tried to kind of throw these passages out. I know he didn't really walk on water. He just walked on a shallow bit of sand. And it was an illusion of him walking on water. You know, people have tried to play down the miracles that are found in this Bible. And yet our God is a supernatural, miraculous God. Our God created everything that we see here today and he sustains it. Our God is a miracle working God. And God does this incredible miracle in Peter's life. And you see Jesus and he comes out onto the water. And we read the situation that the boat is... A long way from the land, so they're not they're not by the shore. They're, they're way out into this huge lake, into the deep part of the lake, and the waves and the wind are beating against this boat. And here comes Jesus in the midst of the storm. You know, I love that. The, the problem is though, sometimes we're so focused on the storm that we can't see Jesus in the midst of it. Sometimes the storm around us is so consuming and captivating that we cannot see Jesus who is coming, walking in the midst of it. Here's what I want to say to us this morning. Jesus is always in the middle of the storm. You just got to look for him. Jesus is always in the middle of the storm. You just need to look for him. Look what happens. He comes on the fourth work of the night. The disciples see him. They think it's a ghost. They cry out in fear. But immediately Jesus speaks to them saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Why does he want to say that? Because fear will destroy faith. And it's faith that they need to walk on the water. The fear will destroy faith. And you know, for some of us here this morning who are Christians, we are fearful about what God will ask of us. We are fearful about what he might want us to do next. You know, they they, they were fearful of Jesus because they thought he was a ghost. But for many of us, we see this kind of figure, uh, figure of Jesus or the Holy Spirit and we think, what on earth is he gonna ask of me now? What happens if he makes me look like a fool? 
What if God gets me to do something that kind of pushes against the tide? What happens if in my school I've got to stand against the pressures of my friends, of my peers? What happens if he asks me to stand up against truth? What happens if he asks me to even pray for one of them and tell them that God is going to heal them? What happens if he doesn't and they laugh at me? What happens if God doesn't come through? He's told me to, to do this or to step out or to give in some way. And I've, I've done what, I, I want to do what he asked. But what happens if he doesn't come through? What happens if I didn't hear him right? And fear prohibits us from stepping out of the boat and into the water. And we're constantly being bombarded by it because we've built up this belief system of disappointment, of disappointment and disappointment. And we've had people that have disappointed us and situations that have disappointed us. And so we don't believe that God is who he says he is. And we are even fearful that he might ask us to do something and we'll look a fool. Fear kills faith. And yet faith liberates us. It's verse 28. Peter answers him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. How many of us here this morning have ever got out of the boat? How many of us have put aside the distractions, the winds, the waves, the pressures? How many of us have heard the voice of God and have actually said within a minute of a heartbeat, yes? Or have we tried to reason our way through it? Well, it probably didn't quite mean that. Or maybe it didn't really look like this. And God wants me to be a good steward. And God wants me to be this and that. And we use excuse after excuse after excuse. And yet all God wants are hearts that will say yes to him when he calls. When God speaks to us, the moment he speaks, the first thing upon our lips is yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. I will give up my ambition and my dreams. Yes, Jesus. I will step out of the boat. Yes, Jesus. I will pray for my friends at school. Yes, Jesus. Even if it, even if it doesn't look like you're coming through, I believe you are good. Yes, Jesus. I, I, I'm stuck in the middle of the storm and you want me to stake my neck out further. Yes, Jesus. Yes. And you know, we can only do that when he has truly captivated this thing in here and this thing up here. When our hearts are truly captivated by Jesus and our minds are placed upon him, that our minds, as as the book of Colossians tells us, are set on things above, not on things on the earth, because the things of the earth drag us down and create fear and disillusionment and disappointment. But the things above liberate and create faith and cause us to say yes. Jesus. I love Peter that he gets out of the boat. You don't read anyone else getting out of the boat. He, he doesn't just follow the crowd. He goes against the crowd. He goes against his senses. He goes against his logical thinking. And he gets out of the boat. And we read that he sinks in a bit. But I love the fact that he got out of the boat. You know, it's one of the things that I've, I've been stirred about in my own life. Even if along the journey, maybe I've sunk a few times. I want this willingness to get out and say yes. Even when it don't make sense to me. You know, I've had it when people have said to me, you're being a fool. You're being reckless with your family and with your life. Why are you asking them to do this? Why are you giving that up? How are you going to survive? Why are you, you know, you're going to just have people against you. And that pressure to kind of conform just keeps coming like wave after wave after wave. And if there wasn't a storm, suddenly there is a storm in your mind. What are you saying in the midst of all this, God? And we lose what he said right at the beginning. And that was just to get out the boat. What I love about the story is that he doesn't say anything else. He doesn't say like kind of get out the boat and then turn right and left or make your way over to the beach. God just tells him to get out the boat. 
You know, sometimes when God is speaking to us, we want it all mapped out. Okay, right, you're saying to do this now. Okay, but what will happen once I've done that? You know, I want, it to, I want it to figure out and work out. I'll get out the boat, but as long as you tell me what the next five steps are. <laughs> I don't know if you can identify with any of this stuff. And yet sometimes God just tells us to take one step. That's why the psalmist said that the word of God is like a lamp to his headline. No, to his feet. He's not a lamp out to the horizon. He's a lamp to our feet. Why? Because so we don't run ahead of ourselves. So we don't get so self-consumed. So we're not just full of pride and think, yeah, I can do this. I can get out of that boat. I can run to the other side. But wait a minute. I didn't tell you to run to the other side. I just told you to get out the boat. And so God, I believe, he just gives us just words, just short phrases, just ideas of what step to take next so that every step is a step of dependence and faith on him. Because this is what I've seen in my life. Every time I step out in faith, God rises up to meet me and my faith is strengthened to take the next step. And time and time again, God has been saying to us, and I've been sharing with people, that we're to take steps, and the outcome of those steps are not our responsibility. If God has spoken to us to take a step, the outcome of those steps are not our responsibility, they are God's. You give a lump sum away, well, where are you going to get food from? It is God's now responsibility to come through. You pray for somebody and you want to see them get healed. It is God's responsibility to manifest, show that healing upon that person. And you know how that just kind of takes its weight off. And suddenly faith is just about listening to God and doing what he says. And man, that sounds so simple to me. I don't know about you, what a simple thing to do just to listen to my father. And when my father speaks, I do what he says. And I don't worry about the rest because my life's in his hands. There is nothing he can ask of me. There is nothing that he, I can give. There's nothing that can be taken away from me that he doesn't already satisfy and fulfill. That there's nothing that cannot be replaced by God in our hearts and in our lives. Nothing. And I actually mean that. And you might be going, well, wait a minute. What about this and that and the other? What about family? And let me say this, I'm not saying that family is not important because I love my family dearly and I would miss them in my own self hugely. And yet God is still saying to me, he is enough. He is enough. He is enough. There is nothing. And when I think about this world, and you know, we were going to talk about life after death, and maybe we'll look at it next week. And when I think about how short this life is, my Bible tells me Jesus is coming again soon. My Bible tells me that Jesus is coming again soon. And every breath I take here this morning is a breath closer to Jesus coming. And, and my life, when I look at it, and I, I remember being a kid thinking like a year was eternity, and now years seem to fly by, don't they? I'm obviously getting old. I remember parents saying these things. And yet it is nothing compared to eternity. This life is literally a heartbeat. A millisecond of a heartbeat compared to eternity and yet my whole life is bound around this world and what I get from it and where I'm going and how it makes me feel and whether I'm happy or whether I'm sad and yet this world is yet but a heartbeat compared to eternity my life is not meant to be lived for me it is meant to be lived for Jesus my life is meant to be sold out completely for him and I fail continuously at that and I get consumed with myself time and time again and yet God grabs my heart wide open and he pulls me back into this place of realizing that this life even Jesus said it that it's like a mist it, it, it comes and goes and yet eternity is what we live for and I cannot bear the thought that I'm not living this whatever I've got, whether I've got a month, a year, 10 years, 50 years left. I cannot bear the thought that I will not live that 
sold out for Jesus. He bought me with a great price with his own precious blood. He paid for me on a cross. He gave up his beauty of heaven for me because he loved me. And how can I not then give my life back to him? How can I not devote my life fully back to him? How can I not get out the boat when he says, get out the boat? How can I not say yes to him when he speaks to me? How can I get so consumed with this world when I have a Jesus, a Savior that loves me and will love me for eternity, that will keep me safe, that I am secure whatever happens to this physical life. My life is secure for eternity. I could get beaten and bruised and burnt and killed and yet my life will go on for eternity. How can I not give my all? to this Savior? How can I not live every single day asking other people to come see who this Jesus is? Eternity is real. There is a place called hell and it is reserved for those that do not know him and it is unquenchable, eternal. It is a place of torment. It is a place that we have chosen to go there because we don't love God. We don't believe God. We believe ourselves and we believe our own way and we choose hell every single day and yet our Savior chose us. How can I not share that with others, that they've been chosen, that they are loved, that they are significant? If you don't know Jesus here this morning, he loves you passionately. He died for you. He gave up everything for you. How can I live one day without seeing my life as a servant sacrifice to him? Will you and I be a church, a people, a gathered community? that will choose to walk by faith and not by sight. We'll choose to live for Jesus and not for ourselves. We'll choose to believe what he says about us and to affirm the love that he shares with us every single day. And let that love be the motivating factor in everything that we do. That that same love that he pours into us, we pour out to each other and into our communities that we're not too fearful to say, look, there is a Jesus and he loves you. But like Peter, we get out the boat. And what I love is it says here that, that, that he, he, in 29, he came out, so Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water. And he came to Jesus, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and he cried out. And, and here's the thing, if we would just get out the boat, it doesn't matter if we sink so much. It doesn't matter if we make little mistakes along the way and we, we lose sight of who he is because here's what Jesus does. He reaches out in verse 31 and he, and he takes out his hand, this is Peter's hand, and he takes hold of him saying, you have little faith, why did you doubt? And what he's trying to say to him, and I, and I get a sense of God's love for Peter, and he said, look, you will never fall. Even if you doubt, even if you get it wrong, I will still raise you back up. And we see that the pier gets taken back up and put safely back to the shore. And he will do the same for us. And each time we fall, each time we take a step, and each time we fall, our faith grows and we learn from it. And we hear Jesus' voice urging us on, encouraging us on, lifting us back up, putting us back up into the rightful place. But we've got to get out the boat. We've got to step out of our comfort zones. We've got to step out of our ne nicely neat ordered lives and plans and, and futures. You know, I've got my, my, my year planned out and this is what I'm going to do on this day and that day. I'm not saying don't make plans. But even in the book of James, he tells us to, you know, why do you make plans about tomorrow? Do you not know that your life is just but a moment? It could come and it could go. And he's not saying don't make plans, but he's saying don't make plans that are immovable. Don't make plans that are so fixed that you cannot be moved by God. Don't make plans that, he won't, that you can't be inconvenienced if Jesus speaks, that you won't just say yes. Can I encourage us to be a people that will step out? And every time we fall, believe that Jesus will pick us back up again. And every time we will move further and further and we will walk further and further and we will begin to be a people where faith that pleases God is in the midst of us. I just feel God wanting to encourage us this morning through the words that have been spoken, through the prophetic words, through the songs that we've sung, that he loves us and he's for us. And if we would choose him and not get distracted by this world, he will take us on a journey 
that you can never and I could never imagine. And there will be nothing that stands against us that he hasn't already overcome and that he will see us through safely to the other side. See us through safely to the other side. But here's my prayer. That it won't just be me and you only. But that we would take bunches of people with us. Friends, families, work colleagues. We would take them with us. And they will come safely to the other side as well. Let's pray.